Chapter forty seven of the Fate A Tale of Stirring Times by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter forty seven. Two brief scenes more, and I have done. The outline of the one probably the imagination of the reader could fill up. The other, however, would require to be pictured more completely. Let me premise that all applications to King James for assurance that Ralph Woodall would not be prosecuted for the events which had taken place at Thetford were vain, and the king, rampant with his success over Monmouth, only showed a more and more strong determination to, to persecute all who showed any favours toward dissenters. In vain Lord Woodall petitioned, in vain the young man's father, now Lord Coldenham, urged that his son was a steadfast member of the church, and had only acted from motives of pure humanity. They knew too well what would be the consequence of Ralph's return to England, and both of them at length went over to pass a few months with him in Holland. When at length William of Orange landed on the shores of Great Britain and marched toward London, one of the most favoured officers in his army was the Honourable Colonel Woodall, and when the crown was placed, by the voice of the people, upon that prince's head, and James himself became an exile, a beautiful and blooming bride sailed gaily over with Queen Mary from Holland, and joined her noble husband at Coldenham Castle. She was beautiful and blooming again, with a certain delicacy of complexion, a want of that high and somewhat rustic health which Margaret Woodall had once enjoyed, gave her husband some uneasiness, especially as her strength did not seem to increase, even in the air of her native land and county. She was very joyous, however, and very happy, and three beautiful babes came as blessings to the household. But no happiness can endure long unalloyed. Within the four years that followed Ralph's marriage, his father and Lord Woodall both sunk quietly into the grave, and Margaret mourned much for her father. Her colour became less vivid, except at night, and she often visited the old monuments in Coldenham Church, and gazed at several vacant places where there was space for a tomb for two more. When people inquired after her health, however, she always said that she was very well, and her husband's eye never but once found a sad look upon her face, except when she was mourning for her father. She was at the moment gazing at her children, and when Ralph bent down his head and kissed her cheek, she put her arms round his neck and whispered a word or two in his ear. "'There is one whom I should greatly prefer,' she said, in conclusion. "'If that should happen, you know whom I mean.' "'Hush, hush, dear Margaret,' said Ralph. "'You grow gloomy here.' We must change this scene, and in the softer air and brighter landscapes of Devonshire find health and spirits for you. Margaret smiled and said that was not needful. She only spoke of what might be. But Ralph carried out his plan, and ere a week was over, the whole family were moving gently toward Devonshire. Suppose two more years over, reader, and you see once more Lord Coldenham, not yet quite nine and twenty years of age. A lady, a very beautiful lady, is seated in a chair where Margaret used to sit. She is in a travelling dress, and one young child of about eighteen months old is pressed close to her breast, and playing among her rich brown hair with its little fingers. Three others, somewhat older, are clustering round her, and all their young forgetful faces are raised gladly toward her, but the tears are falling rapidly from her eyes, and even her husband turns away toward the window to conceal the drop that has gathered in his own. The next moment he returned and clasped her hand in his without uttering a word, and the lady pointed to the children, saying, "'These dear ones do not remember, Ralph, and indeed, how should they? But neither you nor I, my dear husband, can ever forget there has been a Margaret. I will do all I can to supply her place, but that can never be completely.' "'God bless you, my Hortensia," said Ralph, and hurried away from the room. The End End of chapter 47 End of the Fate, A Tale of Stirring Times by George Payne Rainsford James Recording by Lynn T. in Tucson, Arizona